This week I want to talk uh, from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, last week we looked at uh, a little bit about the church as a gathered assembly from Mark chapter 16. Uh, how Jesus is going to build his church and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And God is going to build his church and nothing in this world can stop it. And so today I want to continue that line talking a little bit about what is a church and uh, what is it like, what does it mean to be part of a church. And today the picture that is given in Ephesians chapter 2 about how we are built together into God's temple when he dwells in us. In other words, it's like a picture of a building that's being built that, that God uses uh, to describe his church and how he lives in us. And we'll look at that. Now the context of this verse, I'm kind of breaking right into a long discussion that Paul has. And he's talking about how God has made one out of two nations, the Jews and the Greeks and the Gentiles of how uh, Christianity started in Jerusalem and started in Judea in that area where uh, they were used to worshiping God, familiar with wor worshiping God, and they had all these traditional holidays and laws and rules they had to live by. But as, you, as Christianity moved out into the Roman Empire and you had all kinds of other nationalities, uh, there were misunderstandings about do you have to become a Jew, do you have to be, become circumcised or not. And the Apostle Paul is clarifying some of that, that we are all one in Jesus Christ, that we're all saved the, saved the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. He justifies us. We're all justified by faith. And if you look at this passage in Scripture, it says at least 15 times the words in Christ or through Christ or in Him or uh, in Jesus. Uh, it's really talking about living in Christ and Christ living in us. And that's what really makes a church for us today. There's only 22 verses in this chapter, and there's at least 15 direct references to being in Christ. And there's lots of other references, too, that don't use those exact words, but you know what he's talking about. And so it goes even deeper than that. But it's through Jesus Christ he's made us one at a very costly price, Jews and Gentiles, people from all over the world, have been made one in Jesus Christ through His blood. It took a huge cost to do this, to make peace with all of us. So I want you to know that the unity in Jesus Christ, that we are one in His Spirit, is very important to Him. He tore down the walls. He tore down uh, the hostilities between people of, of one nation over another and things like that. In Christ, those things have been torn down. I want to start as an introduction with verse 13. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You who have been uh, far away have been brought near. And he's describing our state before we came to know Jesus Christ. That we were separate from Jesus Christ. We were separate from God. And if you look around that verse, some of the words that are used there... It says that we were excluded from citizenship, that we were foreigners, that we were without hope and without God in our lives. That's the state that you and I lived in before Jesus Christ changed our lives, before he came into our life, before we knew about God. We were foreigners, excluded from being a citizen. Now, do you like to be excluded from things? Do you like to know that there might be some clubs or some places that you're not allowed to go because of who you are. None of us really like to be excluded, do we? None of us really like to be a foreigner, you know, to be strange, to be an alien. We like to be in the end group, don't we? We don't like to be outsiders, but we were outsiders as far as God was concerned until Jesus Christ's blood covered our sins. We were outsiders, without hope and without God. But He brought us near. Through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful message we have. What a joy we have because of what Jesus has done in our life. Now the passage I want to focus on today is verse 17 through 22. And so let's read that together. It says, He came and He preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Well, that almost gives you chills, doesn't it, to think? Members of God's household. 
and were built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Through him we have access to the Father is what he writes here. Through him, we have access to the Father. And that's a wonderful thought, but it's only through Jesus Christ that we have access to the Father. There's only one Spirit that we have access to the Father through. And I want you to know, as we prepare for our 170th anniversary that we celebrate next week, it's not through this congregation that you come to know God. It's not through... Uh, this building. It's not through this place or any of us. You don't gain access to God by walking through that door back there and worshiping with us. That's not how you get access. You get access to God only through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ when He covers our sin. Now coming to church and knowing other Christians and associates will definitely help you get access to God. It's not a bad thing. But that's not what gives us. That's not, that's not what gives us salvation. That's not what makes us Christians. So when you think about our, our anniversary, it's not about, you know, patting ourselves on the back. Oh, wow, we made it 170 years old. We're great. That's not what we're doing. We're glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ who has been with us that long and has allowed us to serve Him that long. And that's an amazing story because we used to be foreigners. We used to be aliens. But He's brought us close and forgiven us of our sins, and he's brought us peace between the Father and us through Jesus Christ. But it's only through Jesus Christ that you can get this. And he preached to people that were near, and we assume that Paul's talking about the Jewish people that already knew about God and, and were already worshiping. And then people that were far away, people that had never heard about him at all, and they were worshiping all kinds of things, doing all kinds of things. But God makes us all one in Christ Jesus. We all become one in Him. One faith, one spirit, one baptism into Jesus Christ. And verse 19 says we're no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of His household. Isn't that an amazing thought, what God has done for us? So this, this is what a church is. A church are fellow citizens with God's people. That's what a church is. Members of God's household. That's what he has done for us. A church are no longer foreigners, no longer aliens, but we've been made citizens. Now, have any of you ever lived in another country or uh, tried to live in a place where they didn't speak your language? They didn't eat the kind of food you eat. They didn't have the same holidays and uh, lifestyles and views and Values and things that you have. Have you ever lived in a... Most people that I know that are from this area, they've lived in this area all their life. They've grown up with the same friends since kindergarten and in the same family since kindergarten. And you might not know what this experience is like to be a foreigner, to be living in a land where you're not in control. You might not have any rights at all. To be an alien in that land, do you know what that's like? And God is saying that's what we were like, living in our sins, being worldly instead of godly, and He has changed all that. He has brought us here. And He's made us members of His household. And, and that's just an amazing thing that He's done for us. Now, in the last couple of weeks, you know, the television, the, the news reports, uh, you see constant uh, news reports of people trying to get in the border into Texas or New Mexico or Arizona trying to cross that border. And people have come, some of them walk a thousand miles to get there with their families, taking great risks, spend every dime they had to try to get to this border so they can come to our country. And because we have a president now that's a little kinder to immigration and illegal aliens, they're coming by the masses, 30,000 of them, even more than that, trying to get into this country. And have you seen those pictures? Have you seen those pictures? of people that are foreigners trying to get in. And how do you react to that when you see that? What do you think? Do you think they shouldn't be allowed in? I wish they had that wall built everywhere. You know, they need to be arrested and sent back. 
Some of them have come from Haiti, some of them have come from Colombia, Guatemala, El Salvador, all over the place. Because their life is awful where they're living. It's awful. In Haiti, where they have very little vaccine, they've had earthquakes and hurricanes. The economy is, is you know, I don't know if it's 10% of the economy is working. It's awful. And, and, you know, you're lucky to survive there. And these people are giving up their homes and trying to come because they want to come to America. I want you to see that picture. That picture of that alien that's walking in. That is you. That is your story. That is what Jesus Christ has done for you. He welcomed you at the border. He not only did that, he went to go get you. And he brought you into his family, into his citizenship. And he did it by the masses. All over the world, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. He is welcoming into his citizenship and into his family. But we were all foreigners like that when we lived in sin. Before Jesus Christ saved us. Do you remember what that was like? Can you at least have some kindness in your heart to aliens that are seeking something better? Because that's our story. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we were those aliens. And he brought us near and made us part of his family. And you know what's neat about that? He not only let us in, he not only let us in to be part of his family, but he does something even more than that. He makes us into his temple where he dwells. We not only become just part of his family, like a brother or a sister or an in-law or an outlaw or any of those, you know, but he makes us into his temple. It's where he comes. It's where he stays and where he dwells. And he's built on us. He's building us into a temple. And we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, you know, through scripture. You know, you can read what the apostles and the prophets wrote and said. And, and you can read that in scripture on his word. We're built on that foundation. And then Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And it says, in him. It uses those words, in him again. And I want you to know you cannot have a church without him. You cannot have a church without Jesus Christ. Each one of us has ideas about what we should do and maybe projects you think we ought to take on or maybe memories. You know, I wish we could do it the way we used to do it or things like that. Uh, things that you want, things that you desire in this church. That's not how you build a church. You don't just take people's ideas and try them out. But our church is built in Him. His Spirit leads us. What we do and don't do, He's the one who guides us into that. It's His Spirit that calls the shots. And we are just obedient to Jesus. We just listen and are sensitive to His Word. And we're obedient to the Holy Spirit in our lives. Obedient to His Word that He's given us that the apostles and the prophets have given us, he makes the decisions that we follow. Without Jesus Christ, we don't have a church. Without Jesus Christ, you don't have a church. You could have uh, the best church in the world, you know, the most beautiful cathedral, amazing windows, stained glass windows, choirs that are like 40 people that sound like angels. And, and you could have a pastor that is one of the best in the world come and preach. But if Jesus Christ is not there, it's not a church. It's not part of his family. It's not part of his family. You can meet under this tree out here with nothing. With nothing. Not even a hymn book. And just stand there and praise God. But if Jesus Christ is there, it's a church. It's not about this building. It's not about this place. It's about who's among us. That's what makes us a church. Because he's the one who built us into his temple. And it says in him, in verse 21, the whole building is built and joined together. We're not the ones who join people. We're not the ones. Jesus Christ is the one who does that. And so all of the theories about race relationships and all the ideas about race relationships in our world today, all the protests, if you do not have Jesus Christ to join people together, to bond them together, it's not going to work. Jesus Christ is the one that pulls us together. We become one in Him. We can't do that by worldly methods. We can't do that unless sin is dealt with, unless sin is redeemed, repented from and redeemed. And then lives can change, and habits can change, and attitudes can change, and, and laws might even change. But it's only through Jesus Christ. He's the one who brings us together. He's the one who joins us together. And he's the master architect. He figures out what parts you play. He figures out what part I play. He's got the blueprints. He's the one designing this temple. He's the one who's building it. He knows what every piece does. And I saw a picture one time of somebody's house. 
They just built it on the spur of the moment, anything they wanted to do. And it had like 100 rooms in this house. Another family moved in, they built another room. You know, a child had a baby, they built another room. And there were rooms everywhere. Hallways sometimes went to nowhere. You didn't even know what this door would go through. It was just all over the place, haphazard. One of the strangest houses I've ever seen. And I think I saw it in like Guinness Book of World Records or Believe It or Not, Brippies Believe It or Not, one of those shows or something like that. And it was just fascinating, this house. But that's not how Jesus is building his temple. He knows exactly what he's doing. It's not haphazard. It's very well planned out. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what he's got planned for you and he's got a job for you to do. He's got a life for you to live. He's got a person for you to be. He's planned it all out. And he's building his temple. He's the one who places everybody where he wants them. He's the master architect building his temple. And it says that he's rising, in verse 21, it's rising to become a holy temple in the Lord. The temple is still rising. In other words, it's not finished yet. It's still being built. That means he's still working in my life. He's still working in your life. We're not finished yet. So all the pieces might not quite look right. They might not quite fit together yet, but one day they will. And it'll be a holy temple for God. We're being shaped and we're being molded and being constructed. And, and see, when, you're, when the church is being rising, when it's rising, that means we have to grow. We have to grow with it. If you have not made changes in your life because Jesus Christ lives in you in the last couple months, then something's wrong. There ought to be some growth going on. There ought to be something new in our life because Jesus Christ is real and active in our life. And he ought to be acting in us because he's building us into a holy temple. Now, a temple is a building where God dwells. It's different from a, a church building or a sanctuary. A temple is where God dwells. And in, in, in the Jewish temple, they had the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and during the 40 years when they were out in the wilderness, the cloud came by day of God's presence. And at night, there was a fire. For 40 years, they got to see the cloud and the fire, the cloud and the fire, day after day. After day, they saw the presence of God in the temple. And that's what God is doing in your life and in my life. You are his temple. He's building you into his temple. And so this building that's here, and I know Laura Hill takes great pride in, in 1951 when they built this sanctuary. A lot of your fathers and grandfathers helped pound the nails. You built it yourself. And you take a lot of pride in that. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to know that doesn't make it a church. That doesn't make it a church. You look around, you see plaques on every window here. Someone being recognized because of donations they made. That doesn't make it a church. The carpet that we have here, it doesn't make it a church. The pews we have here, the soundboard, the music, the, the projection, everything that we have here, that has nothing to do with it being a church. It's only Jesus Christ living in us is what makes it a church. It's His presence. He's, it's when His presence comes and dwells in us. That's when we're a church. It's not about this building. And it's also not about us as people. It's not about us as people. I know uh, sometimes it gets really sad when someone leaves us. Either they pass away and go to the Lord or they move to another state or something like that. And throughout all my life, I, I know I became so attached, especially as a young Christian, to the pastor. And then they moved away and went to another church and it kind of broke my heart. And I know what that's like, but our church is not built on people. It's built on Jesus Christ living in us in his spirit. You spend time thinking about this building and what it needs. Do you spend time thinking about the programs we're doing? Or do you spend time thinking about Jesus Christ whom we worship? There's a huge difference there. Do you help build other people? As God is constructing his temple and building his temple... Are the things that you're worried about is how are other people part of that? Are you encouraging them and helping them to grow closer to God, to be a better part of this building than they are now, of this temple? That should be what's on our heart first and foremost. Building other people into this temple. Do you teach others? Are you involved with children? Are you involved with youth and your neighbor? Are you building people into this temple? Because that's his number one priority that he's giving us. Do you spend time thinking about other people and building them? Is your life about other people and how they live in Jesus, or is it about stuff? Is it about stuff? Is it about what you're going to do next week? 
where you're going to go, who you're going to see. Or is our life really about Jesus Christ and living with Him, His real Spirit living in our life? And it says, a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. A dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. That's what makes the church. So God is in this place. God is with us this morning. And that's why we're a church. It's not because this building was built in 1951. It's not because 34 people banded together and constituted a church in 1851. And, uh, you know, the longest lasting church, Baptist church in Augusta County, actually in all of central Shenandoah area. You're the oldest church. But what makes it a church is that God is here and God is with us. His spirit is what is important. It's who we worship. You could get rid of everything else but have the Spirit of God and you're still a church. You're still His temple and our life is in Him. Now we might think it depends on us sometimes, you know, uh, that it just won't go on without me. Or we might think it depends on our offering or the resources. Or It's hard not to look at the offering and know we're going to be able to cover the bills or support the mission work that we want to do. But it's not even about that. God, God is not poor. He is not poor. He can do whatever he wants, anytime he wants, whether we give or not. He can. It's about his spirit. And we might think it depends on our work. How much good we do, all of the good deeds and kindnesses we do to other people. All those things are important and great things to do. But that's not what makes us a church. It's his spirit in us. That's what makes us a church. The church depends on his spirit alone. We are a dwelling of him, of his spirit. And, and that's what makes us a church. It's his love working through us. It's His power working through us. It's not our skills and talents. And you know, when we look at people and we try to say, you know, I think they would make a good teacher. I want you to know, it's not about us. It's about who does God want? Who does God choose? Who will God help be the teacher? It doesn't matter if they've ever done it before in their life. It doesn't matter. It's God's love. It's God's power and God's strength working in us. He's the one who does it. He makes us family. He makes us citizens. So I want to ask you, is our dwelling acceptable to Jesus Christ? Are we being raised up into a holy temple that's acceptable, good enough for God? And it's not about the building. It's about our heart and our spirit. Are you and I an acceptable dwelling for God's spirit? So God lives in us in his spirit. Do you know him? Do you talk to him every day? Do you, do you feel his presence in your life? Is he real? Do you have a real experience with a living God in your life? Because that's what we're about. Do you live in His Spirit? Do you know how to let God lead you? Do you know how to listen to His voice when you have a decision to make? Do you know how to get those answers from God? Do you read Scripture and seeking His, His will for your life? Do you pray? Do you talk to other Christians? Do you know how to let Him lead you? And, and, and do you experience His love and power in His life? Are you able to love people that you know that you're not able to do on your own? But with His strength, you can. With His love, you can. Do you see things happen in your life that's only done by the power of God? Or do you only see things that you're capable of doing? You know, I can do this job, so I go do it. Do you see things that only God can do happen in your life? Is the Spirit really living in you? Are you really citizens of His kingdom, members of His family? A dwelling place for His Spirit. God has brought us close. God has joined us together. And God lives in us. Let us pray. And Father, it's amazing to me what you do with us. And, uh, it's hard for me to believe that you would make a plan like this because, you know, as Jeff said earlier in the service, we're just human. We're just jars of clay. We're not perfect and we never will be, but you come and live with us. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, you make us perfect. We get your righteousness. And you build us up into a holy temple. Now, we don't know how to do that. We're, you know, we might have some ideas and some suggestions, but Father, you know exactly what to do. And in a world like this, you're rising up your temple. It looks sometimes like the church is being beaten up. But it, and, and maybe it's struggling. And maybe it's being persecuted. But it is rising up to be a holy temple to you. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, Father. Because your spirit's here. Not because we're here. We're, we can't survive. We can't make it. It's not us. It's you. 
So Father, help us to, to really renew our life with you, Father, to really make an attempt this week to live by your will in our life and your spirit moving in our hearts and changing us into people we ought to be. Help us to really concentrate on that and learn details every day of what that means in our life because we want to be a good temple for you, a good dwelling for you. And as a congregation, Father, we want to be a good church for you. We want to be your church. We want to be one spirit, one uh, united through the blood of Jesus Christ and help every one of us to know in humility that it's only because of you that we can come into your presence. We don't deserve it. We've never earned it. And we never will. But Father, we thank you for your wonderful love that saved us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.